Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for coming What I think uh, to what is going to be, I think, a terrific event uh, this afternoon. Uh, I'm Bonnie Glazer. I'm a senior advisor for Asia in the Freeman Chair for China Studies here at CSIS. And uh, we really have a terrific program today. There's been very good scholarship on nationalism in China and some good analysis of Chinese protests. Uh, but up until now, these issues really have not been examined in relation to Chinese diplomacy. Uh, Dr. Jessica Chun Weiss uh, has made a significant contribution, I think, to the study of Chinese foreign policy in her book, Powerful Patriots, National Protest in China's Foreign Relations. Dr. Weiss is an assistant professor of political science at Yale University and a research fellow at the Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies. And the dissertation on which her book is based won the 2009 American Political Science Helen Dwight Reed Award for Best Dissertation in International Relations, Law, and Politics. And in her book, which I recommend highly to all of you, and copies will be available for purchase, and Dr. Weiss will be signing them after the event, um, along with the wine and cheese, uh, so in her book, Dr. Weiss focuses on the role of diplomatic factors in shaping the Chinese government's response to nationalist mobilization. And she examines not only instances in which protests have taken place in China, but also those uh, instances in which protests have been stifled. So her analysis goes beyond uh, some of the traditional theories about protests as a pressure valve, uh, valve that enable uh, disgruntled citizens to let off steam, or uh, as diversionary activities that refocus criticism of the government uh, and the party at home to other uh, sources. So we're very grateful uh, that Jessica has agreed to share the findings of her research with us today. And after her presentation, uh, Professor David Lampton uh, who is uh, the Hyman Professor and Director of the SICE China, uh, China Studies at, the, um, at, at Johns Hopkins, will provide um, commentary on the book. And then the three of us will have uh, a bit of a discussion uh, amongst ourselves, and then we will open the floor to questions. Uh, so please welcome me in, uh, please join me in welcoming <laughs> Dr. Jessica Chun Weiss. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, it's really a, a delight and an honor to be in the presence of so many who have, who's read, whose work that I have read uh, and admired for many years uh, here now uh, to hear me speak about my recent book. Um, actually, I was a lowly intern uh, at the International Security Program at CSIS uh, some years ago, uh, where Bonnie was, uh, was there at the time. So it feels like coming home, although the home has moved uh, a little bit across town. So the question that I address uh, in my book, and I'll very, you know, in about 20 minutes summarize uh, what I talk about, uh, is the question of what role nationalism plays in China's foreign relations, and specifically uh, the role of nationalist protest. Much has, in fact, been made of, of nationalism's role, but the question is when you know, Chinese diplomats and others say that the feelings of 1.3 billion Chinese people have been hurt, uh, how is it that we uh, should know whether they are um, bluffing or uh, whether such remarks are credible? And it's this issue of credibility uh, that I want to come back to again throughout the talk. In particular, my argument in a nutshell is that the role the nationalism plays depends on how China manages uh, the expression of grassroots popular sentiment in the first place, whether protests are on the one hand allowed uh, to take place in the streets of China's cities, or by contrast, whether they are repressed or nipped in the bud before they can even materialize in the first place, oftentimes uh, using China's uh, vast web of censors uh, to prevent things like the terms uh, anti-Japan, Beijing, uh, from showing up uh, in people's uh, Weibo or Twitter feeds. And indeed, there's a lot of variation in how China has managed nationalist protest. Um, in 1999, uh, China allowed and even encouraged anti-American demonstrations uh, after the US bombed the Chinese embassy uh, in Belgrade. But two years later, and when an EP-3 uh, reconnaissance plane and a Chinese fighter jet collided uh, near Hainan, students were told to stay on campus, and the media told to turn down their rhetoric in covering the incident. And we've seen a lot more variation in how China has managed anti-Japanese protests 
Um, most recently, the large-scale demonstrations of 2012 challenging Japan's purchase of three of the Senkaku Diaoyu Islands. But on many other occasions, uh, including in 2010, during uh, the collision of a Chinese fishing trawler and Japanese Coast Guard vessels actually working to restrain large-scale protests against Japan from spilling out into the streets with more or less success. Perhaps most puzzling is the absence of protests, nationalist protests over the issue of Taiwan, an issue you might uh, imagine that many Chinese nationalists are quite concerned. So these, this is the puzzle then that I set out to explain uh, in the book. And I think that the book provides a corrective to two very uh, entrenched wisdoms in the literature and in the popular press. One is that these are ginned up as a diversionary scapegoat by a regime trying to distract popular attention from other grievances in society. The other is that far from manufacturing or ginning these up, the government is helpless or fragile before uh, explosive popular nationalism that they can't help um, but let spill out into the streets. Now, these two views have a lot of insight, um, but I think they only capture a piece of the story. In particular, they have difficulty explaining why it is that on so many occasions we see nationalist protests prevented or nipped in the bud, activists detained uh, a couple of hours uh, or even the night before uh, the planned protest was to materialize. The argument that I make is that China's management of nationalist protests depends on the diplomatic context uh, in which those citizens uh, seek to mobilize in the first place. In particular, does China want to tell foreign audiences that we are going to stand tough on this issue and we are unwilling to compromise? Or is China's government seeking to maintain greater flexibility as it seeks to diffuse a potential a diplomatic crisis by preventing popular uh, citizens and activists from putting that added pressure on the Chinese government. Now I use this symbol, this traffic light, red light, green light, to indicate that the Chinese government isn't in the driver's seat, it's the people. Um, and the Chinese government is simply signaling when it is okay or not so okay uh, for protesters to go into the streets. Um, and in fact, many of the speed signs that the Chinese government puts up of uh, saying when it is, you know, how fast to go, often are disregarded uh, by Chinese protesters, just as drivers often disregard road signs here uh, in the United States. And in particular, I try to stay a word from this word manipulation. Don't leave here today thinking that Jessica Chen Weiss thinks that the Chinese government manipulates protests, because I think that word makes it sound far too easy for them to simply turn it on and turn it off. In fact, it's very difficult and costly for the Chinese government to tell protesters, look, stay at home, this is not an appropriate time. They, in fact, leave themselves vulnerable to charges of being unpatriotic uh, in tamping down popular expressions of nationalism. That's not to say the government has no role, but it is not primarily uh, you know, driving people into the streets, let alone paying them to be there. And I think that dilemma that the government faces uh, in convincing outsiders that these protests are real and not manufactured is one that you can see here on display. This picture was given to me by a, Chinese, a Japanese uh, consular official in Shanghai during the 2005 anti-Japanese demonstrations. And it means, literally, protesters march this way. And I think that outside observers could be forgiven for misunderstanding or perhaps doubting the sincerity of uh, protest demonstrations when they see actions like this uh, seeming to point or give official uh, guidance to protesters as they uh, express their sentiments. And then again, I'm going to come back to this issue because it's really one that has dogged the Chinese government. So in brief, uh, the first substantive case that I dive into in the book uh, looks at this comparison between two crises in U.S.-China relations, the 1999 embassy bombing and the 2001 EP3 incident. As I mentioned, protests uh, quickly were allowed and then uh, in some cases stage managed over the several days uh, following the US accidental bombing of the Chinese embassy during the Kosovo War. Again, this comparison between protests that were allowed when the Chinese government sought to show the United States and others that China would not be bullied on the international stage contrasts sharply with the crisis that erupted two years later when China and American negotiators sought a face-saving compromise over the terms 
of American regret for the death of the Chinese pilot, with the U.S. not wanting to uh, record, sort of assert responsibility, but nonetheless uh, find an off-ramp uh, to this crisis. And in this context, when China was still trying to uh, establish a positive rapport with the new Bush administration at the time, told protesters not to take to the streets, and again, uh, tried to defuse that crisis. The next five chapters really focus on Sino-Japanese relations. From 1985, the first large-scale anti-Japanese protests to take place in the reform era, all the way up to 2012 uh, with the Senkaku Diaoyu purchase uh, crisis. Briefly, uh, the first of these in 1985 took place after uh, then Prime Minister Nakasone made an official visit to Yasukuni Shrine, where 14 A-class uh, World War II war criminals are enshrined or have been since the 1970s. And these protests, are, I think, are quite interesting in particular because they helped demonstrate to Nakasone uh, that his actions were uh, making it difficult for his reform-minded counterpart, uh, Hu Yaobang, uh, to continue to rule. And in, in fact, uh, Hu Yaobang, as the 1985 demonstrations set the stage for 1986 pro-democracy demonstrations and ultimately the demonstrations that culminated in the 1989 uh, crisis at Tiananmen, did in fact uh, bring down uh, Hu Yaobang and lead leaders like Deng Xiaoping to say, look, you know, if troubles between China and Japan are to continue to still further, it's very difficult for us to explain this uh, to students. And indeed, it was a number of years before uh, succeeding Japanese prime ministers visited Yasukuni Shrine, perhaps keeping this uh, warning in mind. The 1990s, the subject of the next chapter, really look at how China, despite rolling out uh, propaganda concerning China's patriotic education, that in many cases focused on a Japanese behavior in World War II, nonetheless, on a numerous occasions, prevented anti-Japanese protests from taking place. During two crises over the Senkaku Diaoyu Islands in 1990 and 1996, as well as during uh, visits by the Japanese emperor uh, to China and uh, Japanese Prime Minister uh, Hosokawa as well. So again, pointing out that though Nationalism may be beneficial for the regime's domestic legitimacy. Nationalist propaganda does not always translate into a nationalist protests in the streets. I think as we're seeing uh, right now today under Xi Jinping, so far we have not seen um, anti-Japanese or anti-foreign protests. The following chapter looks at the first, uh, sort of in the 2000s, as Koizumi paid annual visits uh, to Yasukuni Shrine, and as Japan's bid for a UN Security Council seat, a permanent seat on the UN Security Council, gained momentum. The Chinese government uh, acquiesced to large-scale anti-Japanese demonstrations in the spring of 2005. These demonstrations uh, helped I think, convince uh, others that uh, China's position on the UN, and opposing Japan's a seat on the UN Security Council uh, was a principled one and also helped convince uh, even then Prime Minister Koizumi to make uh, symbolic concessions, including uh, for the first time a multilateral uh, apology uh, for Japanese war atrocities. The following chapter looks at Sino-Japanese relations from the post-Koizumi period to the 2010 uh, Trawler Collision. And it's in this period, even though uh, social media and the internet had taken off in China, uh, nonetheless, the Chinese government kept uh, a lid on um, most types of anti-Japanese mobilization. I found this out myself firsthand in uh, interviewing or attending uh, the scene of one of these small-scale demonstrations at Marco Polo Bridge. Uh, not five minutes after uh, I showed up, uh, police uh, detained me and asked me what I was doing there, sort of once again illustrating the very close tabs that the Chinese government keeps on demonstrations, even of this kind. Um, those that are ostensibly patriotic and, and supportive of the government's position, but nonetheless having this uh, potential for uh, creating greater social instability. But during this period from 2006 to 2010, China and Japan embarked on this uh, ice uh, thawing uh, to a warm spring uh, in bilateral relations. And during this period, things like uh, petitions uh, criticizing uh, the gas accord uh, in the East China Sea or other uh, cooperative measures uh, were not supported by the government. In some cases, uh, were detained or told that this was not a convenient time to be doing these things. And it was in this context of trying to uh, repair bilateral relations that a Chinese trawler uh, collided with two Japanese Coast Guard vessels near uh, the disputed islands in the East China Sea. And although a lot of attention has been paid to China's 
uh, measures, such as the alleged um, restrictions on uh, rare earth exports. Nonetheless, I think what's been missed is during the first stage of this crisis, before the Japanese side extended uh, the detention of the Chinese trawler captain, China was, uh, in a sense, hoping to treat this incident as an ordinary maritime incident and not eager uh, to inflame this into a full-blown diplomatic crisis. And during this first period of his detention, in fact, uh, nationalist activists, again, discouraged from holding uh, large-scale protests. And again, this is when we saw that censorship uh, take place. Um, in fact, it was during this crisis that uh, Han Han, one of these liberal uh, Chinese activists, found out that he could post the term Senkaku, uh, but not the word Diaoyu online. <laughs> Now, one of the problems I think that emerged uh, from the 2010 uh, trawler crisis was the fact that uh, China's uneven curtailment of these protests didn't extend fully to second and third tier cities. And, and in particular, uh, activists said that they were being held there to avoid attracting too much attention. Um, but this then also, I think, gave rise to some suspicions on the Japanese side that, well, the Chinese can control these. What's the big deal? And in fact, uh, in the wake of the then um, excuse me, larger protests that arose, um, some uh, noted that China had oversold the story on the streets, to quote The Economist. And it was this, I think, suspicion created by China's uneven management and, in fact, the appearance of some unrelated slogans over housing prices uh, and corruption in some second and third tier cities uh, that set the stage for, I think, a greater set of missteps in 2012. This then we witnessed the largest wave of anti-Japanese mobilization to take place, extending to some 200 uh, cities across mainland China. And uh, despite the fact that uh, this was the largest uh, wave of nationalist mobilization, Japanese Prime Minister Noda uh, noted uh, two weeks afterwards that he had underestimated uh, the, sc the scale uh, of these demonstrations. Once again, I turn to this issue of credibility. When <clears throat> pictures like this with a policeman sort of leading the charge, uh, you may uh, perhaps forgive observers for wondering the extent to which the Chinese government can easily dial these up and dial these down. And so the book concludes really on the battle for credibility that the Chinese government faces, that by uh, sort of selectively allowing demonstrations in the way uh, that I have described with a view toward China's diplomatic objectives, either signaling resolve on the one hand or reassurance on the other, these efforts to stage manage and selectively allow protests often lead to accusations that the Chinese government is crying wolf when it invokes the popular uh, pressure of nationalist opinion. And in particular, this local variation with very orderly demonstrations in Beijing and Shanghai, but perhaps more raucous demonstrations burning down uh, Japanese factories in places like Qingdao, uh, or beating up folks in Xi'an. This makes it very difficult to understand the extent to which public opinion really constrains the Chinese uh, government. Moreover, the Chinese government's uh, sort of selective depiction of history um, and the continuing appearance of patriotic propaganda, such as the sort of wartime dramas that are currently being aired, um, often, I think, undercut the apparent sincerity uh, of nationalist opinion in China by letting <coughs> folks like current Prime Minister uh, Abe point to these as the reason, the root cause uh, behind uh, Chinese people's distrust of Japan rather than the, the actual uh, legacy as it's felt at the grassroots. So uh, the argument that I make is that nationalism does matter, but it matters in this contingent way. It depends on whether or not protesters are in the streets, and it matters more when it is raging online than when censors step in uh, to halt that conversation. In particular, nationalism is quite a dangerous game for the Chinese government to be playing. When nationalist protests spill out into the streets, many times that provides a platform uh, for other grievances to be expressed as well. And although many may invoke the analogy to safety valves, I think that's uh, dangerous unless we recognize that safety valves sometimes break with potentially disastrous consequences uh, for the regime. Moreover, even if foreign policy can be used to divert domestic attention from social grievances, this then requires the government to do something on the international stage uh, successfully, uh, and that may put even more pressure uh, on the Chinese government to stand firm rather than 
to compromise. So finally, I argue again that nationalism is a potent force, but it is not one that the Chinese government is always uh, handicapped by. Um, in particular, uh, we've seen no protests thus far over the issue of Taiwan, in part because the Chinese government and, uh, has dispatched experts on particular occasions to prevent uh, demonstrators and students uh, from coming out into the streets to protest over the issue of Taiwan independence. But we are seeing an increasing number of different targets besides Japan, uh, including France. Most recently in 2008, during uh, the, sort of the period leading up to the Olympics, after riots in Tibet uh, prompt uh, international outcry, um, then French President uh, Nicolas Sarkozy entertained the idea of boycotting the Beijing Olympics and uh, was eventually forced uh, to relent after um, anti-French protests spread around uh, China. So far, the South China Sea, and this is a space to watch, but we haven't seen uh, many instances of attempts to organize anti-Vietnamese or anti-Philippines demonstrations. Uh, but again, this is uh, a, a very much a space I think that we should watch as we have I've seen just this year uh, Vietnamese protests against China and continuing uh, tough actions by the Philippines. So in the short run, this may be a tactical asset that Beijing can use to signal its displeasure <coughs> or its willingness uh, to compromise uh, with foreigners. But over the long term, this may pose a strategic liability both domestically uh, as it uh, encourages other folks to jump on the nationalist bandwagon uh, to advance other goals it may also uh, increase uh, the level of discontent or disillusionment with nationalism uh, as a viable, uh, as a viable uh, form of legitimacy uh, inside China. But most importantly, I think it may represent a liability for China's ability to convince outsiders that public opinion in China really does matter and does constrain the government. That's all I have, but I'm really, uh, again, very honored to have been here and uh, look forward to the discussion. Are you going to talk to your chair? Okay, we'll now turn to Professor Lampton for his comments. Thanks. Well, thank all of you for being here, and thank you, Bonnie, for the um, Institute setting this up. And thank you, Jessica, for writing a terrific book uh, that advances our collective discussion and understanding. Um, <clears throat> And congratulations on your Reed Prize. That's terrific, so in all respects. Uh, I guess the first thing I want to say is this book falls in the long line of a distinguished heritage of writing about nationalism, student nationalism. I think back to one of the first books I, wrote, I read uh, was by John Israel on student nationalism in the 20s and, and 30s. Uh, of course, Alan Whiting wrote several different pieces on this whole thing, and we have some Michigan connections uh, here that I'm looking at as we, we speak. Uh, we have Peter Gries, of course, at Oklahoma, has been, been writing on that. James Riley here at GW, was at GW when he did his dissertation, Susan Shirk, and uh, I note in your book you also mentioned Michael Swain and Zhang Tuosheng and so forth. So there's a long continual interest uh, in this topic, and uh, you're certainly one of the major contributions in that long distinguished line. So want to acknowledge that. Um, <clears throat> this book, I think, is interesting on a number of levels. Of course, one level is just its major topic, nationalism, and how it plays into Chinese diplomacy and domestic politics, and how it constrains and provides opportunities for Chinese leadership. But it also brings some uh, fresh information about the demonstrations and the dynamics in each of these um, uh, periods of demonstration that you talk about, starting with the bombing of uh, the U.S. Embassy in 1999, certainly the EP3 incident, all the anti-Japanese uh, uh, demonstrations and non-demonstrations that occurred, uh, as you explained. So you bring some uh, interesting information just to bear on those uh, in a factual sense as well as your uh, interpretation. I like this book because it, it forced me to think about big issues, and I may not have always come to the conclusion uh, in all respect that you, you think might be warranted. Uh, but the, the title of the book, Powerful Patriots, I kept finding myself asking myself, how powerful are these people? 
And I'm ambivalent. And I think in a way you said you come out on both sides depending on the context and so forth. Uh, you said, is this tactically successful but strategically a liability, I think was the last uh, line. And I came away uh, from the last sentence uh, in your book, I thought was extremely important and worth the uh, last few sentences. If China's leadership wants uh, to prevent a counterbalancing coalition of states from forming against China's rise, it will need to temper demonstrations of resolve with credible reassurance. A prudent Chinese leadership should also balance the long-term risks of stoking Chinese nationalism against the short-term gains of diplomatic pressure. So in the end, I sort of, I basically came to the conclusion from reading your book that, of your last sentence, that this is a short-term, almost pheric victory for Chinese diplomacy. It may give them leverage in any given moment, but in the end, it keeps building relentlessly a body of, of opposition, really, or doubt, or a lack of assurance about Chinese foreign policy. So I guess I came to the conclusion, if patriots want a strong, respected China in the world, this isn't the tool that's likely to get it for them. And then, therefore, do they have strength in any sense to achieve their positive goals with this means. And I, 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 I uh, really wonder. So I, anyway, this idea of powerful patriots, uh, I'm not sure powerful in what sense, for what end, over what time frame are we talking. Uh, so that was certainly one set of. Uh, methodologically, I was very uh, interested in, in the book on a number of, yeah, uh, first of all, uh, Many would look at just the cases of what you might call the unleashed demonstrations. But I was really impressed with the attempt to look at the ones that weren't, which almost becomes, in an extreme, the, uh, the cases of something that didn't happen. And of course, methodologically, there is a bit of a problem. How do you define what would have happened had they not deflected it? So there is a, a bit of this, what didn't happen and why didn't it happen and how much was the regime responsible for it not not happening, and I don't have the uh, answer to that uh, question. Uh, I also thought that you were trying to make a major attempt, as you said, to look inside the black box of Chinese decision making. And it seems to me that you basically had, and you had a, a 45 degree, uh, your, your graph with a 45 degree line, and the proposition seems to be that China will repress a demonstration when the risk of demonstrations is greater than the costs of repression. I think that was, and that strikes me as a rational, almost a rational choice kind of model. And I get to my, I ask myself, well, that could be, and your data, I think, are consistent with that conclusion, but I'm not sure that there aren't other things going on in that black box beyond the rational calculation. Uh, certainly the perceptions, what are the perceptions of this Black box. What are the bureaucratic politics going on among uh, members of all of this? So I think you help us understand what's going on in the black box, but I think there are probably some other things going on here uh, about which we need to know uh, more, and not that you could have provided it in the context of this. Uh, this also led me to, you talked a bit about democratic peace theory uh, in this. And I kept asking my, myself, really, okay, what it seems to me is more often than not, the Chinese government is in a sense the responsible party trying to dial this thing back. So then if we've got a democratic political system that allows a greater correspondence between popular emotion and fear or whatever and behavior, is, is democracy, however we would define that in this particular area, is it likely to produce a more moderate Chinese foreign policy? And I have some doubts about that. So it just raised issues for me about democratic peace theory and, and under what circumstances might it hold and so forth. I would just end my comments because I think it's such a wonderfully constructed book with so much good things to say. I was asked to just try to provide a segue to Hong Kong here in the, the current uh, situation and don't be offended by my attempt to develop this, this segue. Uh, but it seems to me that um, what, if I, I've tried to put myself in the mind of the, the average Chinese citizen 
and look at Hong Kong, it seems to me this could be framed in two ways if I'm a Chinese citizen. One is, one is what's going on in Hong Kong is our future and they're out ahead of it, but we ought to be basically supported because their present is our future. I think that's what a lot of people m might either suppose or at least hope. But I think there's another frame and it's my sneaking suspicion this might be the dominant frame uh, in China to look. And that is that what's going on in China, in Hong Kong, first of all, the government in Beijing has asked for patriotic people to be elected. My guess is the average Chinese doesn't question that patriotism frame all that much. What's wrong with being patriotic might be. Secondly, the assertion that what's going on there represents the black hand of the foreigners. We're already hearing that. You might say that's a frame the government puts on it. I think that's true, but I'm not sure it's only the government that has that implicit assumption. I think many Chinese people probably look at Hong Kong and say they've got it so good, what are they whining about, right? So I think one of the key questions on this nationalism isn't just the impulse of people, but how is the issue framed against which that nationalism reacts? And I don't know what the frame, popular frame in China is. Uh, I have an instinct about what it might be, but uh, I think we need some empirical work. But anyway, I think this is a great analysis, not only for the past, but gives us a, a really good lens to look at the future and indeed the present. So thank you very much. Thank you, that was a terrific set of uh, comments. Well, before I pose some questions, is there anything Jessica, you would like to add to or respond to what Mike has raised? Well, I think on the subject of Hong Kong, I think that's exactly the frame that Beijing is using uh, right now is to try to delegitimize what's going on in Hong Kong by accusing foreign hands of aiding and abetting these demonstrations rather than you know, acknowledging their grassroots origins. And mm -hmm. I think you know, the silver lining so far is, is that you know, we don't know what you know, the average citizen in Beijing or Shanghai thinks about these demonstrators uh, because they're not being really exposed to the full range of images uh, and slogans that are coming out of Hong Kong. So, you know, in terms of whether or not, you know, this could, um, you know, blow back against a foreign government, say, you know, the Cameron administration or the Obama administration, I think, you know, I think it's unlikely that we're going to see the kinds of anti, you know, the anti-French demonstrations that took place in 2008, that sort of surge of nationalism took place against the backdrop of a lot of coverage of what was going on uh, in Tibet and in support of the torch relay around the world, whereas by and large, uh, you know, the Chinese public is not aware of what's going on in Hong mm -hmm. Kong. And so even if uh, you know, foreign governments were to take a very pointed stance, uh, I don't think that you would, fortunately so far, uh, although events could change, um, I don't think that you would get the same kind of nationalist backlash. So you would hypothesize, and if I put it right, I would agree with the, mm. and that is that this could veer into a direction that would be so fundamentally threatening that this is going to be one of the cases of, let's say, the regime yes. not, not only incur not encouraging, but discouraging any expression of, organized expression of, a viewpoint about what's going on in Hong Kong, would that be your hypothesis? It certainly seems yeah. to be the case thus far. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, Do you think that there's a, uh, a genuine concern in the Chinese government uh, that uh, the United States or other countries are instigating these protests. Indeed, the term color revolution has been used in the Chinese media. Or do you think this is just a charge that is being made um, to tell the people of, uh, of China that uh, there, of course, couldn't be such dissatisfaction in Hong Kong that it would be indigenous? Mm -hmm. uh, that it's really a result of dissatisfaction that is occurring in Hong Kong, or, or is it a bit of both? I think it's a very cynical ploy to blame this on foreigners rather than to acknowledge that it's indigenous grassroots sentiment in Hong Kong. Um, I paraphrase others in saying this is an insult to the people of Hong Kong to think that this is all uh, sponsored by uh, mm -hmm. foreign governments. So this is, you know, this is a long-standing concern watching color revolutions in uh, you know, the other parts of the world to, to, to blame these on foreigners. Um, um, you know, whether or not, as, as Mike says, whether or not there's any uh, resonance to that charge in greater China as opposed to just from the uh, Chinese regime is, I think, a question we can't really uh, answer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Could you say something perhaps about the protests that took place in Taiwan in the sunflower movement and how the Chinese reacted to those? Of course, it's quite different than the circumstances in Hong Kong, uh, but I wonder if you could sort of apply your framework to that as well. Hmm. Well, it's a, it's a very different uh, setting, and so, uh, you know, but it's very interesting to watch as China increasingly deals with protests against China uh, on its borders and in the region. We've seen protests against China in the Philippines, protests in China in Vietnam. Um, at least in the case of uh, Vietnam, China has sort of said, or at least the propaganda uh, sort of official um, party line is that these were, uh, this was Hanoi taking a leaf out of Beijing's playbook and essentially discrediting them also as something that was uh, from the grassroots. Um, but I think this is something that China is increasingly going to have to grapple with. As you mentioned, the, the protests in Taiwan were uh, you know, primarily, you know, it's, a, some, it's about a local issue, which is the, the process by which these agreements uh, move through uh, the political system. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it, I think it would be to Beijing's credit to, to listen harder uh, rather than mm. accuse first. Mm. Um, uh, so that these sort of mutually acceptable compromises can be reached. In the case of Taiwan, initially, I think there was this reflex reaction to blame it on the DPP. It was, mm. must be the opposition that's stimulating these protests. It couldn't be that the students were really angry themselves in organizing it. And so in that sense, I mm. sort of see a parallel mm. uh, to Hong Kong. I think it took a while for uh, the government in Beijing to figure out that this actually was actually the DPP trying to um, use this uh, to build support and criticize the Mayingjo regime, mm. uh, but I do see uh, some parallels. I wonder if you could comment. You Can I just oh, comment yes. on that? I thought sure. it was a really good point, and that is to say, we're seeing a domino effect of nationalisms and micro-nationalism. Yes, in, in other words, the way Beijing is handling this in Hong Kong can't do anything, I would hypothesize, oh. but make the situation more difficult to handle from Beijing's point of view when it comes to Taiwan and yes. the upcoming election. And so you're seeing one nationalist movement in effect and its handling spill over into even a more important one in the long term uh, foreign policy. So you get a kind of domino effect here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you mentioned in your presentation that uh, there were no demonstrations when Prime Minister Abe went to the Yasukuni Shrine. And indeed, we have seen no protest in China since Xi Jinping came to power. And so I wonder if you could comment uh, mm. on that. What was the mm. reason, perhaps, uh, why there were no protests? Were they stifled? Do you, did you mm. learn that there were signs of people who were planning to protest and they were, uh, they were quelled? Mm. Um, uh, and, and does this tell us anything about Xi Jinping's mm. uh, approach to protests and their relationship to foreign policy? Mm. That's an excellent question. I think it's an important, again, reminder that even though many talk about Xi Jinping as this new nationalist leader, actually the large-scale anti-Japanese demonstrations and the escalation of the situation in the East China Sea took place under Hu Jintao uh, toward the end mm. of his administration. And in fact, I think there's this tendency to want to think about leadership transitions as sort of, for example, I think that the Japanese side calculated that it would be safer to buy the islands under Hu Jintao rather than do so under a, a sort of a, mm -hmm. the beginning of a Xi Jinping administration, but that seems to have been mistaken. Yeah. Um, and so we haven't seen anti-Japanese demonstrations. I think uh, in part, you know, whether it was right after uh, Abe's visit to Yasukuni, or uh, there was another attempted protest over Japan's uh, re proposed revisions to the peace constitution. On both occasions, uh, activists uh, in China were discouraged uh, from holding those demonstrations. And I think that really is uh, sort of indicative of the fact that Beijing thinks that things in the East China Sea are already quite tense, um, and that they, you know, they need no additional pressure uh, from public opinion. Um, because mm. the risk of an accident, uh, all these things are things that the Chinese government is trying to walk back, not accelerate further. Do you, do you think that um, some of the actions like the air defense zone and sort of putting in more hardware and challenging the Japanese uh, waters, or at least administered waters, um, that this is, you said in your book several times that if the Chinese government wants to suppress these, at the same time it needs to be tough on the issue so that there's a certain amount of sense among the population that China, the, the government is pursuing China's national interests. Mm -hmm. So do you think this not having demonstrations goes hands in hands with the tougher measures that I think mm -hmm. I would see that overall she has, has pursued, even though it isn't demonstrations? Do you think this is the flip side of the same coin? Mm 
No, I think that actually repressing demonstrations gives the Chinese government more room to take a softer or more compromising stance. But by taking a very tough stance in the ways that you've pointed out, does make it easier and lessens the, the incentives for these yeah. activists to go out onto the streets. <coughs> and they're much more ready to protest the government when the government has just struck a compromise with Japan. Hmm. But when the government is already out in front, uh, you know, activists who yeah. I've talked with said, you know, we don't, you know, we push and then we can retreat. And especially when things are going their way, as mm -hmm. they would like to see policy go, uh, there is less pressure on the government, to be sure. Mm. Uh, there's one takeaway that I have um, from your book that I wonder if you'd comment a little bit more on, where you talked about uh, the Japanese government's <laughs> Uh, propensity to really not see uh, resolve in Chinese foreign policy, to misinterpret the protests. And indeed, I would extend that to say that uh, many Japanese experts on China, I think, uh, tend to attribute uh, the problems that are going on in Sino-Japanese relations and protests that take place in China as a function of domestic power struggle in China and other you know, domestic factors. Uh, there is a uh, lack of willingness in Japanese scholarship on China for the most part uh, to acknowledge that there might be a, an action-reaction dynamic where Jap Japan takes an action in its foreign policy and then that somehow stimulates these protests and other uh, reactions. And you noted in your book that it was this misreading of China's resolve in 2010 that ultimately contributed to what happened in 2012, the, the um, uh, purchase of the islands and the Japanese misreading of uh, China's uh, 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 stance. So my takeaway here is that crisis management in the Sino-Japanese relationship is ultimately very difficult, complicated by the fact that perhaps Japan doesn't correctly read protests and other, um, the motivations of Chinese decision making. Whereas perhaps in the US-China relationship, where we seem to have read the resolve correctly mm -hmm. in 1999 and maybe applied that to 2001, that maybe the crisis management capability is somewhat easier because of that. And I'd be interested in your comments on that. Well, I don't want to sit here and say we get it all right and they get it all wrong. I think that there's a very noisy set of I, I agree. Very that. noisy set of signals that the, I think that are very difficult for anyone to interpret, and most of those have been directed at Japan. Uh, but nonetheless, I think there is a, a cautionary tale to be read into Japan's sort of the, the tendency to see uh, protests as just the result of patriotic propaganda and not to recognize the underlying uh, historical legacy that makes a lot of citizens quite angry and angry enough to try to protest even when the government doesn't want them to. And so it's not just always the government having the upper hand. And so recognizing the volatility of these sentiments is very, uh, quite important. Um, you know, uh, that said, I think it's, uh, it's certainly something that, you know, they think, we think about what happened last time. And so in 2012, what the Japanese government was looking at was 2010. And in 2010, China did rein in and prevent these demonstrations from getting uh, out of mm -hmm. hand. Um, in part, that was because of their diplomatic objectives at the time. And so, you know, we have to be careful not to always think about what happened last time and to think about what are the signals being sent right now. But the problem is a very thorny one because, you know, China is not always just trying to show resolve. And part of the problem in 2012 was that China was looking forward to and trying to um, sort of uh, plan for the celebration of the 40th anniversary of diplomatic uh, normalization. And so on the one hand, China said, don't go through with that purchase. But you know, things will be OK. Mm -hmm. And so these, this is not just specific to the China-Japan relationship, but this very thorny problem of, on the one hand, uh, signaling strength, on the other hand, not trying to you know, instill fear in all of China's neighbors. Any questions you'd like to ask before we turn to the audience? No, I want to hear the public. Okay, well, I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure that, uh, that everybody in the audience has some uh, uh, pressing questions on their minds. So we'll open up the floor. Please um, uh, raise your hands, wait for the microphone, identify yourselves um, and uh, your affiliation, and uh, then um, please do limit yourself uh, to a question. We'll start in the front here with Jonathan Pollack. Uh, 
Uh, Jessica, first, Jonathan Pollack from Brookings. Uh, I do want to congratulate you on a very, very impressive piece of scholarship. Uh, one comment that I hope you, uh, th this is one of these cases where it's probably utterly spurious, but I note that of the four cases where protest has been allowed, it's one per decade. Uh, it's, it's, 19, uh, it's 1985, 19, 1999, two, uh, 2005. I think I've got that right. Have I got that right? I suspect one per decade. But anyhow, it may be totally spurious. But, um, but, uh, but That's my the formula, Jonathan. Yeah, no, right, right. My, but my, my question actually is a little different. You've, you've put things necessarily into two categories, either protests inhibited and, and not allowed and those that are, that are permitted. I'm wondering whether the distinctions are necessarily that clear cut. Do you, from your own research, do you see cases where there may have been indecision, confusion, divided counsel within leadership about which way to turn uh, in, the, in these circumstances? Or is there some evidence, as I suspect would be the case, in particular for 1999, where events so quickly moved out of control that even if you had wanted to re repress it, it was almost too late to do it? Hmm. What would your thought about this be? And, f and, and one last thought. Are there lessons learned? You know, it's this crisis management manual that you speculate about. Uh, does, do those in Beijing think that they have a toolkit now that enables them, a methodology, if you will, that enables them to uh, evaluate these cases individually or collectively? Well, I hope if they've learned this is a methodology, they've also heard me talk about the pathologies of using uh, this particular tool. Um, on the question of what do we know about the central government's uh, decision making, I think actually 1999 is an example of where we probably have you know, the best, which is still to say, you know, not necessarily official, but records of uh, what, uh, what leaders might have been thinking uh, at the time. And I think that they're, uh, the, the evidence suggests that they were all on the same page and, and there was very early warning that students and others wanted to take to the streets and it was something that was allowed to happen. In fact, the buses were sent in part uh, to prevent students from going to places the government didn't want them to go. Um, and so, but you are right to point to the fact that there is, even within any given episode of perhaps one of these once in a decade events, although there are more smaller events on either side, uh, is that the Chinese government's attitude often starts out with sort of a more lenient uh, position and then quickly we shift to repression as the sort of potentially destabilizing consequences of allowing people into the streets become apparent. So even within the episode we have this change. Um, but then also over time as uh, social media and the internet have become a sort of more pervasive and a very easy way for uh, folks to organize even if they've had no ties to long-standing nationalist organizations, I think it's gonna be much less uh, evident this distinction between repression and allowing. So for example, um, you know, 1990s, you, know, you had a core group of committed activists um, who if you sent them uh, out to Qinghai on an extended vacation, um, there wouldn't be a protest in Beijing. But now with you know, people coming really from anywhere, mm -hmm. I think it's much more difficult for the Chinese government to completely silence or repress uh, expressions of nationalism. I think that's what we saw uh, in 2010, where it wasn't yeah. fully repressed. There were demonstrations. Um, the number of police in Beijing outnumbered the number of demonstrators in front of the Japanese embassy, but nonetheless, uh, the scale was not what it would have been had the government simply opened the floodgates. So I think we're gonna move much more toward this containment rather than um, all outright blanket uh, repression. Very interesting. Well, on, the, on these con cases, though, of confusion, in the decision-making group, uh, I had always uh, thought that the 19, uh, 2001 EP3 was a very interesting case. And uh, Admiral Blair, who was the sink pack at that time, has elaborated a little on it. But at the time, I had people in China telling me, in fact, when Zhang Zemin came out, was it with his four points, punishment, and, and, and you know, backing off on surveillance, he had a series of points that in fact Zhang Zemin had been misinformed by his own people as, a, as to what had happened. Yes, and by, it was an unfold by, by the military. And it had unfolded the reality. But he, he was out now with his tough demands and found out that the, in fact the demands he issued were in reaction to an event that didn't happen, at least that way. And then he had the problem, in a sense he had psychologically mobilized the Chinese people, not 
necessarily in the streets, but psychologically. And now we had to walk it back with, and without saying I was wrong, right? So I think these things, uh, there's a lot of complexity there. And I don't think China's leaders can always assume they're getting the straight dope even on these kind of things, much less day-to-day -day administration. Yeah. Sure. Another question? This young lady here. Hi, I'm Nancy Tom from the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Um, so I, I know Professor Wise, you um, wrote mainly about protests and unrealized process, but I, um, I, I'm wondering if other forms of, um, what you think um, about other forms of uh, nationalistic expressions, um, like what kind of impact do they have on, on China's foreign policy, especially given like um, the, the many venues that, inc uh, that includes uh, media, social media, and just different forms of uh, nationalistic expression. Thank you. Well, yeah, so nationalist protest is really just the, I should say, the most risky form of this type of uh, expression. But we see petitions, and we see, of course, people tweeting things on Weibo all the time. I think petitions, are, are, as well as things that are said online, are also subject to this same kind of uh, repressive apparatus. Petitions in particular, um, but even Weibo is, you know, of course, there's a lot of censorship that goes on. Um, and so I tend to think of nationalist protests as having perhaps the most weight when they are in the streets, but this is a case, not sort of an everyday tactic. Um, but I think that we probably should be uh, rather skeptical of uh, arguments that the Chinese government uh, you know, must do X, Y, Z because you know, people on Weibo have said this. Um, because we don't know, you know to what extent that actually represents of opinion that the government must respond to or face you know, a terrible crisis of legitimacy. Um, if they didn't want those uh, opinions, although on the other hand, you know, they wouldn't be there. Um, so they are, do reflect something, of the, the, especially the range of options that might be uh, feasible. Um, but you know, by and large, I think that you know, it's, it's something also to watch as a, as a type of signal. But there's some added confusion, I would understand that one way to deal with this is to delete it if you're the great firewall, so to speak. But the other is it's to guide it. And there's a whole large population of bureaucrats that aren't trying to stifle discussion. They're trying to focus it. So I don't think you can sometimes even distinguish between popular opinion and central leading. Is, is that a fair observation? My understanding is that Chinese netizens can spot a so-called 50 center from oh, pretty far away. 50. Yes. Um, because oh, they don't have adopted the, the kind of slang or the kind of you know, oh. colloquialisms that uh -huh. reflect genuine opinion. But I don't always think that, that line is uh, so clearly drawn. Um, mm -hmm. But the fact that there are this, this attempt to shape opinion online, I think, uh, further you know, erodes the credibility of, of claims um, that this is something that they are sort of they're bound by all mm -hmm. the time. Phil Saunders? <laughs> Phil Saunders from National Defense University. I really look forward to digging into this book. Erica Strecker Downs and I did some work on this, uh, I guess about 15 years ago. Uh, and <coughs> two things a little different from the story that you told. Uh, we looked at the 78, 90, and 96 uh, crises with Japan. And one of the things we found was that activists in Hong Kong and Taiwan often played a leading role in starting that. And so I'm curious about your assessment of whether that's still true or whether that was because they were more free to mobilize at that time and today some of the rest of Chinese society on the mainland has caught up. And then the second point that we found is once the protests escalated to the point where they started to interfere with economic ties with Japan, that was where the government shut it down. And it happened at that point in time, those particular three crises, the Japanese government had particular economic leverage as they were renewing yen loans in 90 and 96, and when Deng was trying to attract Japanese investment in the earlier period. Uh, but Bonnie, among others, has pointed out that that balance may have changed, and the Chinese government now feels it has the ability to use economic tools coercively. So what's the role of economic mm. factors? Is that central to the story or, or marginal to what you, uh, mm. you describe? Mm. Thanks so much. And indeed, your article with, with Erica Saunders is, is quite seminal in thinking about the repression of these protests rather than uh, those that are allowed. Um, on your first question, absolutely. The act, this is, again, the activism of those in Hong Kong and in Taiwan and even uh, some here in the United States, this Diaoyu uh, movement. 
uh, is further evidence that this is not being seeded by Beijing, or by the Chinese government is not instigating this. At first, it comes through often from the outside uh, in. And so, for example, in 2005, this campaign against Japan's bid for a permanent seat originated with activists in the United States. And it was taken up by activists inside China who then got permission to post it on, on Sina and other uh, major internet portals. Um, so regardless of where this grassroots origins comes from, whether it's domestic or transnational, this is something that the Chinese government then reacts to and either gives it a platform or uh, doesn't. Um, so I see that th that continues to this day. For example, the 2012 uh, demonstrations against Japan, that whole campaign was kicked off by the landing of activists from Hong Kong uh, on August 15th, which for the first time in a few years were allowed to set sail from the Hong Kong Harbor. Um, and so even now, Hong Kong is now beginning to, well, not just beginning, but is today a feeling uh, that stricture uh, of Beijing's priorities. Um, to your second question about uh, the economic role, that I think starting, you know, as China has grown uh, more powerful, I think that China has tried to have it both ways. So for example, in recent uh, anti-Japanese protests, the messaging has been, you know, uh, it's one thing to protest Japan on these political issues, uh, but boycotting Japanese products makes no sense uh, because most of those products are made in China and would hurt China. Um, so even you know, officials like Bo Xilai made this statement mm -hmm. in 2005, and that idea has been repeated in more recent protests. And certainly with the Philippines and others, China has begun to, I think, demonstrate that it is willing to use discriminant economic measures to put the pressure uh, potentially on other uh, countries, although it's, you know, not officially owned up necessarily to doing so. Um, so I don't see economics necessarily as putting the brake as firmly on these uh, types of um, activities. Okay, another question? State board, ambassador. Uh, Dr. Weiss, th uh, Stapleton Roy with the Wilson Center. Uh, thank you for a very interesting presentation. I haven't had a chance to look at your book yet. But does it even briefly make an effort to link the um, nationalistic demonstrations under the PRC to the earlier pre-PRC demonstrations, going back to May 4th, 1919, mm -hmm. and uh, during the 30s, et cetera? I mean, there's a long tradition. And I just wonder, are the earlier ones different somehow from the ones that occur under the PRC? Uh, and of course, we didn't have the same type of demonstrations during the first 30 years of the PRC, but it's a more yeah. recent phenomenon as it opens up the um, society a bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would say that the recent demonstrations are more like the ones that we saw in May 4th and the 30s than they were under the sort of the Maoist era of the state-sponsored rallies. <coughs> um, they, I think it's this very specter of you know, May 4th and other student movements, these nationalist movements that rocked and in fact toppled uh, previous regimes that I think lay the backdrop for the current uh, fear that nationalism uh, will turn against the regime and take it down. Um, I don't you know, delve into these uh, specific cases empirically. Uh, the, bulk of the, you know, the book is really taken up with 1985 to the present. But I, in tracing uh, the 1985 protests, I look at how they then also set the stage for pro-democracy protests. Once again, tracing this link between uh, pro or sort of anti-foreign uh, demonstrations and the risk that they might uh, challenge the regime itself. So that specter, I think, very much haunts the regime as it thinks about how to deal with protests today, uh, and, and indeed, in, then in turn, informs foreign governments as they think about the risks of nationalism inside China. Very good. OK, over here. <clears throat> Laura Silver at the State Department. Um, can you speak a little bit about what tells protesters whether or not it's going to be sanctioned or not? Is it physical police force and arrests and intimidation? Is it change in the media narrative? Is it censorship online? Is it some combination of all of that? What kind of lets people know if the floodgates are going to be opened or closed? It's all of those things. Um, and you know, the intimidation and repression doesn't uh, take the kind of more a nasty form that it does with democratic uh, dissidents or liberal uh, activists. But nonetheless, you know, activists you know, in talking with them would talk to me about, well, they would know because you know, reporters would come around or not. Um, and then it, it depends on what's being shown in the media. And then you know, it comes down to they call up the police a few days ahead of time, and the police say, go, no, go. Um, and so the, a lot of these things are negotiated uh, informally, not in paper often. Um, with the local security bureau ahead of time. Um, and, and 
Rarely does this happen completely spontaneously, even though that's the, the watchword that the Chinese government would like to use. I, don't, I didn't find any evidence that the government was taken completely uh, by surprise by any of these large-scale uh, demonstrations. You have this wonderful example in the book of, um, I think it's sort of a passerby that encounters this protest and asks this uh, policeman mm -hmm. if, uh, if she can join. Mm -hmm. And uh, she says, I haven't applied. And he says, it's OK. You can yes. go because somebody else has applied uh, and, and, and gotten approval. And then she asks, well, can I protest and, and yell something about anti-corruption? And he says, oh, no, you can only yell Diao Yu. So, so, <laughs> <laughs> so some great uh, anecdotes like that in the book. Uh, another question? Yes, over here in front. Uh, hi, I'm Winslow Robertson. I am a China-Africa strategic consultant, and I was wondering if you could bring up the 88-89 anti-African protests, which are an interesting combination of domestic politics and international repercussions. And I know they're not the biggest or most famous, but something that interests me. Yeah, mm. very interesting, and I think a show a different side of Chinese nationalism that we don't usually see. I think. Usually, one thinks of national sentiment as reserving its most vitriolic side and almost racist side for its relationship with Japan, that the you know, anti-Americanism doesn't take on that same sort of uh, gut level, um, sort of essentializing uh, component. But I think that the, you know, the 88 sort of anti-African riots over this fraternization in Nanjing is, a, is, yeah. a, is an exception to that, yeah. hopefully one we won't see much more of. Yeah. I, I should say, seeing how Hopkins runs the, it's part of the joint venture there. Um, in that case, it seemed like I wasn't there personally, but as it's recounted, um, in fact, the, the provincial authorities and the municipal authorities completely supply, uh, supplied security. So it didn't spill over into the, the American center, let's, the, uh, the Hopkins Nanjing Center. And yet they didn't exercise a lot of restraint, as I would understand it, on the demonstrations on the rest of the campus at least for some period of time. So sometimes it seems they get instructions to, on the one hand, let the thing run its course as long as it doesn't affect certain sacred institutions or, or groups or diplomatic, uh, highly valued assets. Does that accord with your understanding? Yeah, oftentimes in the negotiations over what form these protests can take, they will negotiate essentially a contained sort of demonstration. Right. One activist told me that when they wanted to protest, I'm forgetting exactly what, uh, but that um, you know, they could, if they wanted to have it, oh, this was to, gain, to gather signatures uh, in support of the opposition to Japan's permanent uh, uh, Security Council seat bid. Um, and there they were told that if they had it in front of the Beijing embassy, uh, they could only have something like 10 to 15 participants for a very short period of time, you know, 10 minutes. But if they had it in Chaoyang Park, which is large and a very little chance that this will become an incident, um, they could have it you know, for as long as they wanted with as many people coming through as they wanted. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Robert Griffiths, uh, former Consul General in Shanghai, um, now at the Defense University. Uh, following up on uh, Bill, uh, Phil's question, now that China has a greater ability to project power, both economic and military, in the region, is that going to affect their willingness to allow demonstrations? With the, I, mean, I guess my thinking here is that previously, when they really couldn't back up their rhetoric with action, maybe they would you know, hold tamp, tamp things down a bit. But are there, is there going to be a, more, a greater willingness to allow these things to happen? and then couple it, perhaps, with greater demonstrations of force and sanctions or military or economic action? Mm -hmm. You know, I think China's rising power cuts both ways, because as you say, they can do more to back up uh, and to appease the demands of those who might spill into the streets. But on the other hand, you know, China's you know, growing capabilities, military and economic, mean that it has many other levers that it can use uh, to sort of get others to back down. And so they may not need to resort uh, to the case of nationalist protests. So maybe you look at the case of uh, China's uh, sort of contretemps with Vietnam over the summer, where you had 
I, th I would say all the ingredients for a really nasty back and forth Chinese protest against Vietnam in response to the Vietnamese protests against China, but you know, paired with the Philippines, you had much more sensationalist or you know, provocative coverage of the dispute with the Philippines than you did with Vietnam, where the media really tried, I think, sort of pre preemptively uh, to prevent that kind of sort of anti-Vietnamese sentiment um, from coming out. And so there, I think, you know, the China holds the upper hand, and it didn't need to do any more to provoke mm -hmm. uh, Vietnam, which was already quite incensed over the deployment of the oil rig to the South China Sea. Um, whereas I think that you know, China has far fewer cards given. You know, well, obviously, China is also uh, much more powerful than the Philippines. But you know, faced with this uh, sort of international litigation, there's not a whole lot um, that, you know, that China has recourse to that other than you know, telling the, the Philippines that this is useless. To get back to what, uh, another angle on your question, which I took to be, if there's more power projection, is there less incentive or willingness to allow domestic demonstration? It seems to me uh, that's implicitly a, a bit of a, I don't mean your, your hypothesis, but that's a little optimistic perhaps because the more there's power projection, I mean, one of these times China's going to lose or be perceived to lose, and that could set off. Uh, something. I mean, just imagine a, an incident between a Chinese naval vessel or a Coast Guard vessel and a Japanese vessel. That could provide the spark for something they would find very hard to control. So the, the, uh, I could see that really operating both ways and in the negative scenario in a very negative way. I mean, I think that's one of the real dangers of having this much hardware in such close proximity, both air and naval assets that you could inadvertently trigger something that in Chinese domestic politics you really wouldn't want. How come after all these years we still lose a ship? You know, mm. that, that kind of thing. So uh, I, th I think this is a dangerous world we're in here. <laughs> I think we all agree with yeah. that over here. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, you mentioned the Yaskuni Shrine as one of the two sort of touchstones, uh, the other, Daiyu Senkaku. My name is Kunio Kikuchi, and I'm with Washington Research. Um, Yaskuni is dangerous because the perceptions of what Yaskuni Shrine is is so completely different uh, from what the Chinese and even the Americans think of and what the Japanese consider the shrine to be. Uh, many Americans think that uh, that's where the remains of the, uh, let's say, two dozens or one dozen or so um, Class A uh, uh, war criminals are buried or something. But it's not that. It's just uh, a shrine dedicated to listing the names of all those people who died in the service of the Empire of Japan since 1867 or so. And the Empire of Japan uh, ended in 19, uh, precisely, I guess, 1945, or at the time of the signing of the treaty. Uh, so there are no new names, and there are about 2.5 million names there, 13 of which, as you know, are Class A uh, criminals. And in the Shinto rubric, if someone dies, it's treated equally. So the Japanese say, this is a pure Japanese uh, shrine, and why can't we go there? The danger is, many Chinese say it's an anti-Chinese shrine. And every time a Japanese politician or even an American politician wants to raise the tension between Japan and China, all they have to do is for the prime minister to go to Nash Yaskuni Shrine, and that's a dangerous situation. Has there been any uh, effort to educate the Chinese people that Yaskuni is not anti-Chinese uh, shrine? Thank you. Most of the focus on Yasukuni Shrine has been surrounding the 14 A-class war criminals that were enshrined there in the 1970s. Many point, people point out that why did China put up such a fuss in 1985 when Nakasone went? Well, it was because he paid an official visit that uh, was declared constitutional by a committee that he appointed, 
And this was after these uh, A-class war criminals were enshrined there. So I think there have been a number of proposals, um, not by myself, but by even Japanese, to suggest the creation of a secular a shrine or simply the movement of these particular uh, spirits that have been enshrined there that are the most offensive not only to China but to Korea, and that this might be a way for both sides to get what they want, which is you know, a, a national cemetery where uh, the, you know, the prime minister can uh, sort of within reason visit, but also uh, to respond to and address the concerns of, of Japan's Asian neighbors. Do you want to add to that? Lauren? Hi, Lauren Hershey. I'm a semi-retired attorney, but I've been an amateur China watcher for about 46 or 47 years. Um, I'm 67. Uh, starting to learn a few things, uh, and I thank you very much for the presentation. I too look forward to getting into your book. I have a couple of very simple practical questions and then kind of a philosophical one. Uh, will your book circulate in China, and will it be translated to Chinese? Well, I welcome the day that it will be circulated and translated into Chinese. I can't say yet whether that will be next year or you know, some unspecified years down the line. I haven't actually uh, yet gone through that process, so I don't know whether or not it would be deemed too sensitive or not. Uh, keep us posted on that. Uh, the second question relates to, uh, well, two, two parts, really. Uh, your scholarship, um, could you share with us what you would like to next look into? Then I have a third question. <laughs> Absolutely. The brief answer is I'm very interested in the rise of uh, sentiment that uh, confronts China on its uh, borders. So the, we might call it the rise of the anti-Chinese sentiment, the mirror image of what I've looked at here, and how China has responded uh, to leaders that have employed this as well as a more cooperative tone um, in, in, conf in dealing with China. Mm. We'll look forward to that one as well. You have a planned publication date? Oh, just getting off the ground. We're talking academic years here. <laughs> okay, the, the, uh, the, the long-range kind of philosophical question, uh, thinking about the rise of modern China rather than the rise of China, is the question about popular sovereignty. Do you address that in your book? I haven't looked at the book at all. Is there any way in which these protests, staged, organized, Chinese opera style, whatever, is this be the beginning or a renewal of the uh, May 4th movement? Uh, it's, it, it's as broad as you want to make that, uh, hmm. if you could. Well, I think all Chinese protest movements in some ways see themselves as the sort of the successors of the May 4th uh, generation. But I, I see in China actually a, a fair bifurcation between those who sort of advocate more liberal uh, reform and those that champion nationalist causes. This is in part, I think, because of concerns that linking these two, nationalism and more uh, democratic reform, um, are become uh, much more sensitive uh, in China today. And so those that agitate on foreign policy uh, do not touch domestic issues. And those on the liberal side uh, of the divide are quite concerned about being tarred with this uh, nationalist brush, um, one that seems to be uh, managed, if not manipulated, by the Chinese government. Okay, here in front. Uh, thank you. My name is Yura Cho. I'm from GWU, a second year graduate student. Um, the point you raised in your conclusion that there's no protest against Taiwan really interests me for a long time because I know this is really an important issue for China and its uh, core national interests. Um, as far as I've observe, observed, uh, the, the strategy China used to um, deal with, with Taiwan problem mainly, mainly separated in two parts. One well, maybe, uh, for example, 1996, the missile crisis in the Taiwan Strait, and up till now, the Chinese is using, Chinese government is probably using, utilizing its economic power uh, toward Taiwan problem. So there seems to have no room for uh, these kind of national protests to, uh, keep stay, uh, to, play, to play a role in handling this Taiwan problem. I just wonder if you can extend a bit about why do you think there is no na such kind of national protest toward Taiwan problems? Uh, is, there sim uh, is that simply because China has other tools to deal with Taiwan or because China has, uh, uh, China has the confidence to deal with Taiwan, not utilizing, well, if it's if it's utilized, if the national protest is utilized as a tool, uh, China doesn't have, to use, ha doesn't have to use this kind of tool to deal with Taiwan problem, or it's simply because Chinese government uh, doesn't 
regard Taiwan as a foreign problem. Thank you. Hmm. Very interesting. Uh, China obviously does not regard Taiwan as a foreign problem, but nonetheless, there have been attempts by students and others uh, to try to protest against what they see as splitist or independence-minded forces. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, there's, a, I think, a combination of, of China's confidence as well as the recognition uh, that saber-rattling vis-a-vis Taiwan has been counterproductive, uh, has instilled uh, some sort of restraint in Beijing and in relying upon more reassuring gestures as the best way uh, to speed uh, the progress of cross-straits uh, relations and progress rather than uh, using these more uh, hard-hitting uh, sort of um, saber-rattling type of tactics. Another, I think, part of this uh, plays to the fact that I think from Washington to, to Tokyo, foreign governments recognize just how committed China is uh, to preventing uh, Taiwan from becoming independent. And so given that recognition, I think there's also less need for China, you know, fewer provocations, if you will, and less need for China to respond uh, to try to correct uh, mistaken misperceptions that China might not be uh, willing to fight and even a potentially devastating war to prevent that outcome. You know, uh, Jessica notes in her book, for example, when Chun Shui Bian was uh, first elected, that there were actually efforts to uh, protest, and there were some uh, requests to hold uh, some some protests that were that were not uh, permitted. Uh, and, and, and I think um, you know this point that she makes is really valid about how there are so many other ways that China has that its signals resolve in the case of Taiwan. And we can look back and point, for example, to the anti-secession law mm -hmm. as a very clear way of signaling China's resolve about Taiwan. So that I think there was less sort of need mm -hmm. to hold uh, those kind of protests. I do think that, for example, in the case of the US government, any administration has been quite clear about uh, the sensitivity of this issue mm -hmm. uh, to the government in Beijing. So I do think that it has been less necessary as it may have been seen on other issues. Mm -hmm. Yes, over here. Uh, hi, I'm Shannon Tiazzi from The Diplomat. You touched earlier on the role of social media in making protests harder for the government to, um, to discourage. But I wonder if you could talk about the role of social media and the internet in fostering nationalist sentiment outside of the government's control. It would seem that before the internet and the rise of alternative news and social media, that Beijing would have a lot more control, not only in the tone of coverage, but also in what information is available that the public can then react to. So are we seeing a rise in non-station nationalism even before the protest stage as information that Beijing might not want public or in a tone that Beijing might not agree with is reaching more and more people? Yeah, you've touched up, uh, on a very important development, which is the, you know, the commercialization of the media and the proliferation of, of different news outlets that are really trying to attract eyeballs, uh, as Susan Scherf likes to say, <laughs> or other, I mean, that's a Chinese phrase. Um, but I, at the end of the day, these news organizations still you know, heed the party's instructions as regards what is and isn't okay to be reported. Now, once it's okay to report it, they then amplify that message, and I think it does uh, spread uh, much further. And, but you know, I'm, that's not to absolve CCTV of also you know, the very particular angle that it has taken and issues with Japan. Um, and so I think it's, it's appropriate to call this sort of an echo chamber. Uh, but it doesn't always echo because the government does you know, set certain lines, say, on Hong Kong or uh, on Vietnam that uh, prevent the tone from going in sort of an exorably nationalist uh, direction. So I, I think on the whole, the, um, you know, the trend has been in a more uh, tough nationalist direction, but I do see a lot of variation over time, and we should, I think that variation is valuable to pay attention to. Okay, um, in front. Hi, uh, Bill Tucker. I'm a former member of the White House Counsel's Office during the Reagan administration, and I've done a lot of work in Taiwan, China, and Hong Kong also. And um, why, why do you think uh, China continues to want to control Hong Kong instead of, I mean, Hong Kong is a cash cow uh, for the country. And so why wouldn't they encourage more entrepreneurship in Hong Kong? And uh, 
they're now, by cracking down, they're frightening away businesses, which they have to know that, they're, that they are doing that. Most of the, of the U.S. and the, of the Western businesses locate their headquarters in Hong Kong and then send their, send their people into interior China. And so it's a, it's a great arrangement for interior China. And so why, why would they try to repress that? I think China, the leadership in Beijing, wants one country, two systems in Hong Kong to succeed, but on their own terms. And they've been very inflexible about those terms, um, st standing firmly and unwaveringly uh, behind the August 31 decision. And of course, this is uh, to great frustration of those in Hong Kong who see this as not genuine democracy uh, that was promised to them. But from Beijing's perspective, I think that they would like to see this gradual and orderly progress. And they see this as in keeping with their past promises. And so there's a real tension over you know, what's going on has resulted in the, the protests that have you know, ground Hong Kong to a standstill over the past week, although the signs are that this, these nascent talks uh, between the opposition and the Hong Kong authorities will uh, proceed. I'm hopeful that they will make some sort of progress. Um, but I don't think that China wants to stamp out what is in Hong Kong. I think Hong Kong's vibrance uh, and the rule of law there benefit uh, China's overall economic development. And I think Beijing would be foolish not to recognize that. So, I would uh, sort of cast the situation in a little bit of a different uh, light than the one that you've uh, portrayed, but uh, I, I am worried uh, and, I, and I'm concerned that, the, that Beijing won't be willing to show the flexibility uh, necessary to, to meet the demands of those who are uh, in the streets. If the Chinese were to make some small concessions, and there are many, I think, different proposals that have been made um, in Hong Kong, as well as by some uh, academics um, uh, here uh, of uh, different ways that a compromise could be reached. Yes. But if, if China were to make even a small concession, I think the government in Beijing fears that this would have a sort of spillover effect in the mainland, that this would lead to greater demand for political reform and democracy. Do you think that is, in fact, a genuine fear? I think that, that the fear of contagion is actually a little bit overblown. I think that China also stands to lose and set precedent simply by allowing the stalemate to go on. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that making this all go away very quickly uh, would be in Beijing's interest in terms of the overall stability, uh, its objectives in mainland China. Um, and so one of the, I think, beauties of one country, two systems is that it is regarded as a separate system. And so I'm not sure, again, this is a question, what do people in Beijing, Shanghai think? I don't think we really know. But I think many, anecdotally, many think that Hong Kong is separate, is different. And so if Hong Kong even were to become a fully fledged you know, direct democracy overnight, I'm not sure that you would find you know, people in Beijing and Shanghai necessarily saying, now it's ours. Um, because I think the Chinese government is very well equipped to deal with that. It's shown itself time and time again to be very uh, willing to, to crush that kind of dissent. So um, actually, I think that. Uh, Compromise is certainly in the interest of Beijing, and I don't think that this fear of contagion needs to be uh, as uh, overwhelming or loom as quite as large as it seems to be. And far worse, I think, is the precedent being set for Taiwan, as yeah. Mike pointed to. I might just take a stab at that <clears throat> question is, why are they pursuing policies that business, that might drive business away, seem to be the core of the question. Um, well, of course, you have to ask what Beijing is listening to in, in terms of representation from Hong Kong, and it's hearing from the, we'll say the large end of the business community. So it is hearing a, bus a business view, I'm not saying the business view, but a powerful business view that puts a high priority on gradual change of the political system. The key word in the sentence is gradual. Uh, and so I think Beijing is listening to the part of the community that's very economically motivated and has big stakes in some arrangement that looks quite close to what they have. And so it isn't that they aren't listening to the business community. In some sense, they are listening to the business community. I'd say that's the first thing. Sen second thing is Wang Yang has been appointed, as I'm given to understand, uh, to, to be sort of trying to broker this crisis, deal with it. And he was the uh, leader in Guangdong, the abutting province with Hong Kong and uh, resolved several conflicts, 
Wukong among them, and mm -hmm. that, say resolve, that's a complicated. Managed. Managed. Uh, and so it seems to me they've, they've picked somebody who has a reasonable understanding of the totality of what's at stake here. I take that to be a good sign in and of itself. I'm not predicting this will end happily. I'm just saying that seems to be a good sign. Uh, and uh, thirdly, I don't think we should misunderstand exactly probably how Beijing understands its own actions. I mean, in the uh, joint declaration and then the basic law, they promised a general suffrage election. And it isn't our idea of what the full spirit and meaning of that would mean. Universal. Suffrage. Yeah, universal. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, this is a step pro forward by given where they were before. And it's not as far as me or a lot of other people might have a hoped. But China could have had a less, <laughs> I hate to say, forward leaning, but a, a more restrictive policy. So I think there is, you can see, and there, it's partly how they conceive what they've done and what, and then secondly, who they're hearing from. Uh, and uh, I would agree very much with Jessica. I think there's some moves that Beijing could agree to, like what's the nature of this nominating committee, right? Okay, we're not gonna change the, 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 the character of the election in terms of nominating this time, but maybe in 20, you know, 2015 or, or I mean, in, the next election cycle will move one step further. In other words, I think there are a lot of things that creative minds could come up with if they wanted to. I, I another hope way, another Beijing's way to in the framework, um, frame of mind to mm -hmm. think of these things. Well, of course, another way to dealing, it w uh, to dealing with this would be to lower the percentage of people in the selection committee that have to choose the candidates. So right now it has to be more than 50%. Mm -hmm. So if That's that were right. lowered, um, to something right. less than 50%, um, then that would give the potential for somebody right. that is not uh, that popular to be, uh, in, in Beijing's eyes, to actually be among the candidates. Right. Uh, but that, again, there's many different proposals that mm -hmm. are out there, so we'll have to see if any of them are adopted. I think we have time for one last question, if there is one. All right, in back on the right. Um, oh, sorry about that. Okay, I take a last if chance. The, if they're both short, we'll take both of them since I okay, have really I, pointed to the okay. other gentleman. My question but go ahead. will be very short. Um, I am a research fellow from Taiwan at CSIS. Um, my question is, um, in terms of nationalism or Chinese nationalism, as we all know, it's shaped by um, cold um, century humiliation and uh, a signal Japanese war. But in terms of these two factors, uh, as we all know, Taiwan and mainland China, we share the same culture, but uh, the uh, nationalism are very different to one another. So uh, from your um, point of view, do you think how Chinese government educate their people for the certain nationalism as, as being very powerful? And also um, for this nationalism uh, from your book, from what I understand is talking about how to deal with diplomatic issues internationally. But the problem is this nationalism has been kind of like a backfire to Chinese government. So do you think how Chinese government are going to deal with this problem, uh, I mean, uh, for, for against the Chinese um, government? Okay. Please pass the microphone to the other gentleman. Ask your question. Oh, well, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Stanley Seiden. I am a student with Johns Hopkins University, SAIS. Um, I'm curious about your approach with regard to these ideas of nationalism. So my questions are, what is nationalism and who are the nationalists? And I, I mean that from your perspective. So what was sort of your working definition going in of, of nationalism? And then who are the people participating in these nationalist protests? In your experience, were there lines drawn between ethnicities, between genders, between classes? Uh, in, in general, those, those are my topics that I'm interested in. Thank you. Great, well, thanks so much again for all your attention. Um, I will refer you to the book for the specific definition that I use of nationalism, but in terms of who participates uh, in these protests, it's, it typically is Han Chinese, and by and large, they are male, although there are certainly uh, women involved uh, in the protests, and it crosses uh, uh, all different uh, generations. Not all of them uh, are, are very young, and many of these committed activists are you know, you know, 50 or uh, in some cases 60 years old. 
Um, some of them remember the war, others of them uh, don't. Um, and you know, this is really an evolving, I think, uh, space. And certainly, the composition of these protests, um, who comes out, um, you know, is oftentimes it's migrant workers, uh, it's you know, it's office uh, white collar uh, workers, some of whom have designed their own flashy signs uh, that they use their own printing uh, process to do so. Um, you obviously students uh, represent a, a large uh, bulk of the protests. These tend not to take place. Uh, in more heavily minority areas, in part, I think, because the government is worried about any sort of uh, instability, uh, even uh, expressions of, of anti-foreign nationalism, because who knows if this is a Han uh, Chinese nationalism, what other types of nationalisms uh, you might incite. I think, in, in general, the nationalism China would like to see is one that is inclusive uh, and, and, and celebrates the Chinese state, of course, the, the state around which the CCP is uh, leading. Uh, but nonetheless, the, all these other strands of nationalism vie uh, for prominence, and uh, I think this is a, a very difficult message for the Chinese government to control. This is one of the most volatile aspects uh, of a nationalist protest, is, is keeping people on message, chanting about the Diaoyus, as opposed to other things that they might like, right. uh, including a more accountable or responsive uh, government domestically. Um, and the first question? Um, Maybe we can talk uh, afterwards. OK, uh, we'll Berlin. leave that Thank for you. a conversation, conversation afterwards. So we do have, um, first of all, a, a table set up uh, with books. And uh, Dr. Weiss will be signing. Um, so I encourage you to go purchase a book if you're interested in reading it. And secondly, um, it's been a terrific discussion. And I'd like you, uh, please, to join me in thanking Dr. Jessica Chun Weiss and Professor Mike Lanford. <laughs>